and Storm's just kind of standing there watching. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe my eyes. Um, it was bad. You know, I have been a big supporter or fan of like Exodus and Hope's relationship. I love the whole Holy Warrior thing. I love the like side figure. I enjoy stories about faith and stuff like that. This took a turn that A, I was not expecting, and then B, I just felt like it was kind of embarrassing. Um, mostly on, obviously, X. How could you not, how could you not expect it when it's... Another episode of another relaunch. I am uh, Piotr Nikolaevich Rasputin, aka Classic. That man. I am Elvin Daryl Holiday, aka Rage of the New Warriors. Oh, okay. Taking it back. Taking it back. And you know, I was actually reading some Sam Cap comics the other day, and Rage was a part of some of those storylines. So I was like, oh, look at one of Sam's nephews. I was like, he really what built up. Not, not a nephew. <laughs> <laughs> What happened to all those like new warriors? Where are they at? I mean, Firestar's the next. Like... And Nova's actually hanging out on the rock up. So shout out oh, to them. True. They made it. Everybody <laughs> else. <laughs> Good luck to you. <laughs> what a shame. I wonder where they could possibly put them. I guess I mean, but... Marvel doesn't really have like a lane for those. But when I think about the New Warriors, I like it. You know, I went back and read all those stories. I like Night Thrasher. I think his design is really cool, but I don't think they've ever really been able to fit him into, like, the genius, playboy, billionaire, tech guy thing that they've done. It's like, it's thing. Like, yeah, they've, like, always kind of struggled with that with him. And then all the other characters, I don't know. Name Marita? I don't want to see her. <laughs> that is a choice. Um, and... I don't know. Like I said, I don't really like Nova. But I did like Speed. I don't like Nova either. I did like Speedball and Rage. Um, but Rage. I like Justice. Ugh. Rage pops in and out every now and again. And Speedball was supposed to be there, you know, Spider-Man equivalent. But his powers, I they're they're kind of weird. And then they did the whole like. They don't really have like a real <laughs> explanation. <laughs> It doesn't have real explanation. It just does anything and everything. I'll never forget once it changed his costume. I was like, how did that happen? And then they did the whole penis thing after he, uh, him and Nitro blew that town up and he started doing like energy blast and it was blue, which was hot. But it was also really depressing because, you know, he had to have pain to access the power. So he had a yeah. suit, which was also hot. But it was like... That suit was not hot. <laughs> that was hot. Like the spikes coming out and everything. It was very... Uh, I loved it. But return now again. The new warriors are they're lost in limbo. And then and then they tried to do that other new warrior group that had the kids, and they were like named Snowflake and Safe Space. Never and, saw the light of day. <laughs> and that man did that interview, and then the internet was like, absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> they cut that quickly. <laughs> so, shout out to them. Poor them. I don't know. I guess that's not really brand new from that now. Yeah, honestly, because that backlash was bad and quick. What are you gonna do? Move on, I guess. Pick up the characters that can move us to other places. But I guess Marvel really does need like a a Titans. You know, no, they don't really have like a. I don't think so. <laughs> Those people need a lane. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and get to the updates of the week. Um, so first up, we are going to bring up the um, Writers Guild of America Guild. Um, they are on strike right now, and recently they just re- shut down the production of Blade. Now, they were in pre-production, getting things started there, but now that has been shut down. And the uh, strike has been talking about going to other productions and wondering if Wonder Man was going to be next. They feel as though if they get enough of these productions shut down, they will have their uh, demands kind of looked at. And I say, shut it all down. I'm on their side. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm totally fine with a lot of this stuff kind of waiting, you know. And I personally feel like 
with, with the blade situation with it being shut down that's probably for the best because okay. they were <laughs> they were going to start they they were going to start filming it but like they hadn't even written it yet so there was no script there was nothing and like honestly the blade has i, I would keep saying it's really good um mm-hmm. Herschela, mia goth Aaron Pierre, Delroy Lindo, like, these are people I like. I think they're going to be able to do, like, a really good showing for it when they actually get the chance to film it. But I'm here for the writers. I support them. Strike. Get your money. You deserve it. I've been watching this show called Mrs. Davis on Peacock. It's really good, actually. You guys should watch it if you haven't started it yet. But she is actually, like, fighting against an AI in the show. And it's just been so interesting because as this writer of Guild Strike has been going on, they've been articles coming out saying how the studios are looking into getting AI to write the scripts. And it's like, no, AI is not the good thing here. Like, that's not what you want. Just pay the people. Why is that such a hard concept? Isn't that wild to think that these movie studios have produced so many movies where AI ends up, like, not being a good thing? But they do it anyway now. They have the option to not, but they do it anyway. All because you just don't want to pay somebody. And the things that these, uh, the like negotiations are asking, they want like, like three percent of the marketing budget of what you would spend on these studios. It's not even like a lot of a lot of money at all. Like compared to how much it makes. But I don't know. <laughs> Wild. Why, why pay somebody <laughs> to do a job? I don't know. I guess. Capitalism, I guess. What a crazy concept. Um, also, we want to bring up that Jim Lee was promoted to president, publisher, and CCO of DC Comics. Now, everybody knows Jim Lee is the artist who kind of really revolutionized a lot of our favorite characters back in the 90s, especially the X-Men. Um, and from there, he's pretty much had a very... A, a great career. He started Image Comics with a lot of his other friends who wanted to leave because they weren't being <laughs> compensated correctly. And um, then he went over to DC, started doing a bunch of stuff there, also started to rise as more of a, on the executive side, but still drawing. Um, and now he's been named their CCO of the DC Comics. So now he will be in charge of overseeing everything as far as the comic side is. And I will say, if I know that he had already been on the DC executive side before this, and if he was involved with this dawn of DC era that they've been doing, it's been fantastic. So I think like that shows anything that he's going to be a part of. I'm with that. Yeah, Jim Lee is. I think he's a. <laughs> I think he'll do a good job. <laughs> I think he will do a job. Um, He's been in not business, he's been in the business for a very, very long time, and I think he knows a lot of people. He's very well connected. He has been a lot, I think, of a he's been a part of initiatives I feel like that have tried to amplify diversity in comics, especially over at yes. DC as they try to do a lot of those things. Um and that'll be like you said, Donald DC has been really good. So if he's been part of helping that get off the ground, we could be going somewhere. Mm-hmm. I mean, he may not have been, or I should say, he, the New 52 may not have been great, but, like, at least it was trying to do something fresh. Um, so mm-hmm. I'd appreciate that, you know, he was there doing kind of stuff like that. We'll see what that means going forward. Um, yeah, because he's still, he's still, still, he's still, he's still on the night. He still <laughs> <laughs> comes from a certain breed, and so we'll see what happens. We'll see. Yeah. Um, but all right, y'all, that's all the updates we had this week. Let's go ahead and take a break and then we'll come right back. Yo, 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 welcome back, everyone. Welcome to another week of comics. And it was quite a hefty haul. A lot of stuff was going on. I won't talk about too much of it because, honestly, I was confused on some of it. I was just, like, jumping in on a couple of things. So, (laughs) 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 some of it. Um, The books that I have been reading that were really good, Poison Ivy number 12 came out this week. It's just, you know, it's Poison Ivy. It's that book. You got to read it. Are still going strong and it's going to continue. So shout out to them. Um, Moon Knight number okay. 24 came out this week as well. Now let me tell you something. Venom was in this issue. I was so irritated reading it. 
Like he fails. I don't know what to tell you. He gonna pop up. Did you know he's a child? Vin like Eddie Bryan. It's his son. Oh. And he like comes around because he's like, oh yeah, my dad used to talk about you. Why would Eddie talk about Moon Knight? What are you talking about? But whatever, Venom's a kid, so it's just like it really like whereas Venom clicked down for me, it just like went even further. It was like no. Um it's Moon Knight, this is his twenty fourth issue? This is issue twenty four and then next is twenty five and that's the big double um double like spread issue. It's gonna introduce the new Scarlet girl, Layla, and yes. tie into that mini series that's coming out. It's gonna be big, so everybody check that out. Is this his longest solo? No, but it has potential to be. Okay. So, fingers we'll crossed. We're watching the scene. We're watching think, the scene. I think, <laughs> I think we might get another 50 issue world over here. Like, the tide's changing. So, we'll see how that goes. Um, Scarlet Witch number five also came out this week. You know, this is a cute little book. She had her big fight with Scythia. She won. Scythia beat her up, and then she just like magicked herself away, and she like convinced her, oh, I can be good, you can be good and better than whatever you're doing, and she was like, girl, okay. So, yeah, everybody want to talk when you get your ass beat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> next issue, Wiccan shows up, so we will be tuning back in for that. Um, oh. And Barbarella, the center cannot hold number three, also came out. You know, I'm always gonna shout out my girl when she's got a book because she always keeps a book. So. Yes, you do. I'm you know title I, just really doesn't. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so our main books of the week is actually our first book is the throwback series, The Authority Number One, and that comes from Warren Ellis and Brian Hitch, and that's being read by LZ. Let's go. Let's go yes. On. So you know, um, we were going to be integrating some of the rereads and stuff back into the comics because child, the, the X books are what they are to me. So I, <laughs> my pull list has been kind of left. Um, but of course I've been rereading a lot of stuff, so I'm just gonna reintegrate a lot of that into the comics I'm reading. So if you wanna jump on and read the authority with me, come on. I haven't read this in a while and I've never read all of it. So um this will be interesting to see how I feel about everything now. Um, especially like Midnight or Apollo. Y'all know Apollo is like a top three DC character for me, so um I'll be interested to see how I feel about like them afterwards. Uh but issue one I opens up people like, love me more. I think so too. Like, <laughs> first of all, like before you even get started, I gotta say I love Warren Ellis. Like he is one of my favorite, probably top three of my favorite comic book writers of all time. I love a lot of his stuff. I think he writes action scenes really great. This authority stuff it really hooked me on Midnighters, especially, um, and you'll see why as you go into it. But like them as a couple and just the way they grew and like, everything they did, it's really good stuff. You're gonna love it. But go ahead, good to you. Yes. Um, okay, so before this, if you wanted to read, there's a Wildstorm series uh, where the characters, are actually, well, Apollo and Midnight are actually introduced. Um, and this kind of picks up at the end of that series. So that series ends basically with, like, the whole team being killed <laughs> and, like, the main hero guy who was, like, the big guy in the sky, he turned out to be a villain, right? So they all get killed, the guy's a villain, end of Storm Watch. Now, the authority starts off this issue and there are these like Asian Superman <laughs> characters that mm -hmm. rain down all over Russia and just start like killing everybody. <laughs> and they, they got like <laughs> super strength, laser vision, just like slaughtering people. And um, then we find out that like the back in New York City, there's this guy, Jackson King, and um, I forget the other girl's name. Um, uh, oh, Christine. She, they were like in, they used to be a part of Stormwatch, but like after it got over, Stormwatch used to be funded by the UN. It was basically like the UN's Justice League. But after that got done, the UN couldn't afford it anymore, so they cut it. Now they are just like liaisons basically for like super human incidents. They don't really do anything. They sit in this like small office <laughs> somewhere in New York. But of course, they're like seeing this thing go on in Moscow, but they can't get involved in it because they don't have like Stormwatch anymore. And all of a sudden, Jenny Spark shows up and she's out of this door and like she is saying, come with me, like you can tell me what you guys know, we're gonna like get involved in this, uh, this situation here. We learned that 
there's this place called Gamora Island, which I think is not real. And, um, but there was this guy who had two brothers and um, he, they grew up, ended up taking over the entire island. And when they were like 20 years old, the brother, the one brother killed the other two brothers so he could control everything. And now he just wants to like basically spread his hate across the world and take over. And he feels as though he has to like attack three specific sections. So he already hit Moscow and next he's gonna go to London. And we see um, uh, Jenny Spark is kind of going around and you start to get introduced to everybody like on the team and all the different characters. There is um, the engineer who is this like robot girl who previously, I guess from the last wild storm, there was this old engineer who had this like big tech suit after he died all of his nanotech like i guess in that instant went to this other girl who was like really good at robotics and um, like human integration with robotics so she became this like engineer she's basically like the new person who is she's kind of like a cyborg kind of character looking um but she's like all metal uh, uh, there was also this guy this girl who's got these wings she basically can fly. She's got, I think she's got like maybe some sharp claws too. Another guy who like his power is working the city and he become, become like one with the city. <laughs> and it can like all of a sudden, like only in cities though, can he like scale buildings. Like his feet will change so he can like scale a building or like he could see really well like in a city um, because he gets his powers just from a city. Um, and then <laughs> it's the way that every time you say city, you can hear the question mark at the end to be like, what kind of power is this? <laughs> Why is he only it doesn't make any city? sense to me. <laughs> I'm like, I feel like you're just trying to be different just to be different, but <laughs> whatever. It's just like in the city. <laughs> <laughs> like, I guess that's cool, whatever. Um, but he gets sent out on surveillance. He's like sent out in to Moscow. He like uses his powers to like commune with the city. He finds like the little logo with this circle and two dots on it. It's called the uh, circle and three dots on it. Then um, Jenny Spark is going around. She's asking for a sit rep. Like, where is everybody? We, she's like, where's the dynamic duo? And um, they're like, and the engineer says, they wouldn't like it if you called them that. Obviously, you're talking about Apollo and Midnight, which I think is a great thing that they like. Like, don't call us the dynamic duo. We're not <laughs> Batman and Superman. Um, obviously, must. with the <laughs> I say, they don't <laughs> way. no, they don't. Um, and Midnighter is saying, you know, we shouldn't even be a part of this team right now. We work better when we were like working in the shadows. Um, Apollo is like, no, like if we need to be Midnighter and Apollo, like we get to grow up if we were gonna do something bigger. Um, and do something better. We also end up finding out that they have this like ship that is moving through the higher dimension, but also like hovering through Earth. And that is how they are open to like open these teleporting doors to get you anywhere because they're in this like machine that somebody found. It's a MacGuffin basically for them to have a doorway to get anywhere, which I'm fine with. I'm, it's like we gotta have them. You, you always gonna say you always got one. Yes, yes, it's a Krakoan gate, if we be serious. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and then, like, all of a sudden, of course, uh, the Gamora Island villain was like, you know, I want to strike right now. I'm not going to wait till Moscow gets better. Let's do it now. So he has London. We see London is completely decimated by, again, these, uh, like, Superman characters. And then, of course, Apollo comes in, and he starts, like, beating their ass, and they're getting, like, blown back and they're like, who is this? The engineer comes in. We also learn about uh, the shaman who is basically like Dr. Strange. He's got these magic powers. I guess the previous shaman, they like, I kind of like the avatar where all of their knowledge can get passed down to the next one, all their magic abilities and stuff. You can commune with the past shaman. So he's got magic abilities. Uh, Swift was the character who has the wings and like the claws and stuff. And Jenny Sparks is a lightning character. She's like, living lightning basically um and then we see this like really cool last page of the team i am in really like this issue um i was like really blown away obviously apollo was really cool but like i really liked the way that the team kind of came together and mm -hmm. we got straight to the action right off the bat yeah. <laughs> yeah. ellis is always gonna right give you the action 
Like, it's going to come, it's going to hit. Okay. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. What would you like rate this first issue? Um, I would give this, honestly, a four out of five. For it okay. To be, this is from, ni- this is from 1999, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, man, but it's you know. still held up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this book is from 99. Uh, but it still held up. Like, it is... <laughs> I like, like I like the art, um, and typically I haven't been that into Hitch's art more recently, um, but I liked it a lot here, uh, and I really enjoyed the pacing and the story that that, that Roy and Alice was telling throughout it. So definitely a four and a five for me. I don't know. I feel like I I feel like I didn't even like Hitch's art back then. I might go. Um, hop in. You may hop in. I'm probably going to say something nasty about Midnighter at some point, and you're probably going to want to hop here. I think it's going to be interesting to see just kind of, like you said, this was written in 1999. So a lot of, like, the dialogue and the way comics were written was very different back then. And I'm interested to see kind of, like, how that holds up and goes into it. Um, remember when I was rereading Moon Knight and they was calling people the F-slur every other issue? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. stuff like that. When well, I will say, like, the... Um... The design of the Asian villain in this <laughs> is a little problematic. Yeah. He's kind of giving a very Fu Manchu trope. So that's not great. <laughs> <laughs> like but, I said, it'll be interesting to see like what we catch now. And it's just like, oh, this is something that shouldn't have happened. But yeah. that's comics. So, all right. And moving on to our next book of the week. I think this is fun one. This is Immortal X-Men number 11. That comes from Karen Gillan and Lucas Wernick. Now, this is some fallout from the Sinister event that just happened this week. Um, Sons of X also came out this week. I don't think I mentioned that. I did read it. But I was kind of confused on it, honestly. I have been catching up on Legion of X on Marvel Unlimited. And this basically spoiled what's happening in Legion of X for me. But <laughs> nonetheless... <laughs> Even so, like, the parts of it that I knew and I was just reading, I was just like, I don't know. But this kind of made me think I might not be the biggest fan, I don't think, of Spurrier. I think he can be hit or miss for me, and I feel like that was kind of, like, the big parts of why he misses for me, just, like, walls and walls of text. And I do not like Mother Righteous. I'm sorry. She gets on my nerves. She got to go. But there is a really nice moment with Nightcrawler in that. But back to Immortal X-Men. Um, dealing with that fallout, you know, once... Rasputin came back in the Dominion issue. Her and Mother Righteous kind of told everybody about what happened in the futures with uh, Xavier, Hope, Emma, and Exodus. So Storm, they were put into the pit. Forge has figured out how to kind of remove the sinister gene from them. They find out that he used like a dimensional loop in the strand of DNA to like have this thing going back. And so they were able to excise it. But of course, he's like, you know, science is infinite. We don't know he could have had a backdoor backup for that. Or if we got it out, we don't know if it'll come back. We don't know what it's going to do. We just don't know if when Hope resurrects people, it'll still put the Sinister Gene in them. These are all things we have to watch. So Storm is basically telling them, you guys can't be removed from the council because it's going to cause too much of an uproar. But your votes won't matter. So you'll still be on here. It just doesn't mean anything for that. Xavier and Exodus are kind of, of course, having a hipsy fit. And Storm's like, I got to show you guys something. So she has Rasputin. They have put all of the history that happened in the Sins of Sinister with them destroying people and then Hope committing genocide and then Exodus killing Hope and all of that stuff on the Summer Jam screen for them. She makes them watch it. (laughs) And she says, this is what you all did. This is why you all are getting this type of treatment. And, you know, she's kind of saying, like, she did. And she was like, you know, now what do you think so all the arguments start storm also goes to destiny and destiny is being herself destiny is annoying i thought i was liking destiny but let me tell you something she what is no and it Birthday also makes you feel like <laughs> her and mystique are genuinely the cause of every single problem that we face yes <laughs> yes mystique is a nasty lady Mystique is definitely a nasty lady, and Destiny is just as nasty, and that's why they love each other. And it's like, (laughs) because you two sit around and you say that you don't want to do anything but be with each other. Go be with each other. Why are you over here bothering everybody? Just lying for no reason. For no reason. So anyway, Storm confronts Destiny like, you knew all this stuff. You were doing all this. Destiny's like, oh, that wasn't me. You know, that was a different woman. 
And now that I know it, <laughs> I'll never be that one. <laughs> you know? That wasn't me, girl. <laughs> she, was like, she was just like, you know, and she's like, and it sounds like whatever she did, did this, this, and that, and revealed this, this, and that. So she was like, so you can say thank you whenever you want to. But while they're going back and forth, um, that's happening. Exodus and Hope are arguing. While they're also arguing, Mother Righteous, speaking of MacGuffins and annoying women, pops up into Mystique's room again. And she's like, <laughs> Mystique uh, immediately attacks her. Knife <laughs> <laughs> to the face. <laughs> like, knife to the face. And she's like, what are you doing here? Mother Righteous gives her a recording, which seems to be Destiny revealing all of the stuff that she did in Sense of Sinister and then, like, trying to keep Mystique alive because Mystique is supposed to die. We cut back to the big fight with Exodus and Hope. Hope is upset for some reason because Exodus killed her in that fi- alternate future, that I guess if you can call it that now. And this is where I kind of didn't like gel with the story because it didn't make sense to me. Hope is mad that a future Exodus infected by Sinister did something to a future her infected by Sinister. And it was just kind of like, okay, that's not us. So they're fighting. Exodus is like, I'm not going to fight you. Obviously, you're a child. Hope talks about her powers, and she's like, what do you think power manipulation means? She actually takes Exodus abilities away, and she beats him down to the ground. He's kind of like, mocks her in the beginning. He's like, oh, what are you going to do, your little girl? You can't hit me. And she's like, I've spent all my life fighting Cable. Da, 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 da. And she kicks him in the face, and she punches him, and he seems like he gets knocked out. And Storm's just kind of standing there watching. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe my eyes. Um, it was bad. You know, I have been a big supporter or fan of, like, Exodus and Hope's relationship. I love the whole Holy Warrior thing. I love the, like, side figure. I enjoy stories about faith and stuff like that. This took a turn that, A, I was not expecting, and then, B, I just felt like it was kind of embarrassing. Um, mostly on, obviously, Exodus. How could you not, how could you not expect it when it's Gillen's favorite character. Of course he's going to make sure Hope looks great. The one he, like, built from the ground up. I don't know. It's been her story. Look what he made sure he put her on the council. I guess I just made... I guess I just assume writers are going to be fair to all of the characters in their story. Whereas, like, even if something they do is bad... We'll we'll get back to that. It's because speaking of things that people do is bad... You know, Storm sees all the stuff. She's got to go to Araco. She runs into Emma on the way. Her and Emma are talking. She's like, you know, you don't seem shaken up about this. It's like other people do. Xavier is very much, don't talk to me. I'll call you. I ain't really, because he don't really think he did anything wrong. (laughs) 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 You know, that's why he's acting like that. (laughs) That's why he's acting like that. Um, And Emma's like, you know, that wasn't me. You know, she was kind of pulling Disney. Like, I didn't do that stuff. Yes, like, I, people have thought I was a bad guy before. Okay, whatever. And Storm's like, you know, you don't change. You're doing this. And Emma's like, girl, hold on. Pump your brakes. <laughs> she does a little Let's swerve. Talk about you. <laughs> she was like, you know, she does a little swerve and she starts to call out Storm. She's like, you know, you talk about everybody else and what we were doing in this future. Five years had gone past and you didn't notice anything. Your time has slipped between Araco and Kirkoa. You can't tell us how to live our life and what we need to do and like how we need to make things right when you're not even fully invested in what's going on here. Storm gets upset, which means she, she was clocked. <laughs> <laughs> and it was funny because her. and it was funny because Emma is sitting there telling her, like, you know, hey, we need you. And Storm is still walking off to Araka. <laughs> walking, marching straight to the king, pumping, if you, if you will. Looks good, though. Um, Shaw sees all this with Mother Righteous because he is also a pawn of her because Mother Righteous just keeps appearing everywhere for some reason. And then we cut to the end. Storm is approaching someone in the council. She's like, you know, hey, I do need somebody to kind of like look out on things and what's going on. We find out that she's talking to Colossus. Who, for those who have been following, on the team of summer, and for those who know, Colossus is also currently a Russian spy for his brother Mikhail over in X Force. So 
Colossus technically has three votes now because Storm gets in her vote when she's away, and then at the ends of Sons, Sons of X, excuse me, this is a spoiler for those who didn't read it. Um, at the ends of Sons of X, Nightcrawler leaves Krakoa, and he gives his vote to Storm. So Colossus technically has three votes on the council right now. Four of the uh, council members' votes don't matter. Destiny and Mystique are themselves. Shaw is, I don't know. I think Kate's going to be leaving the council soon because she is, you know. Joining the X-Men, right? Joining the X-Men. So we're going to see how things go. It's not looking good for Storm. Everybody's kind of plotting against her and they're about five steps ahead. But I think she works best under pressure. So I'm excited. I read this issue because it's the storm issue. I hopped into, I wanted to see what was going on. Um, you know, storm's still the doll. And I, obviously I loved all the storm stuff in it, but y'all already know the Exodus stuff was just like, why? <laughs> it was like very blatant. This is, I'm using this to like show how cool Hope is. Like how many times he 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 got beat up for two pages, yeah, with not, no powers. She <laughs> with no powers. She, she, she took a she took his she took his bending away and then proceeded to beat him up. He is li- and he literally says, "I was a knight. Like you're a little girl. You can't beat me up." He's been doing this for centuries. Ain't he old? Yes. Well, not really. <laughs> he like went. He like went. Into always the tomb trying to defend your old faves. They be old. They not oh my god, you are ages. <laughs> <laughs> I love aging. I think it's beautiful. That's why I don't know why you're trying to not to stay oh. <laughs> they not oh. They just getting up there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. But I, 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 did, I did not appreciate any of the stuff with Exodus. I am hoping that he either A just gets a return to form at this point or just moves on and does something else. Um I think it's time on the council. I will I say that I agree with that, and I don't necessarily think this issue is perfect. I even think some of like the character motivations of how they portray the voices of like Storm interacting with the other four and stuff like that, like there are points of that that all it feels like some of it is written for an obvious reaction, like to you know what I'm saying to get into that. Yes. So we'll see how that goes. But overall, I think the big theme of the story, what it represents, I personally like when people kind of step to Storm and they're like. Yes. Stop acting like you doing all this stuff and you're not doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> like, I will admit, y'all now also know that I do not like Emma Frost. She is on my mm-hmm. top three least favorite X-Men characters. <laughs> and I will, you know, she did eat that one thing. She, <laughs> she, I will that admit, one thing. she ate that one little thing. I will give her that because it is very true. When she walked off and Emma was like, don't forget that anything that happens here is on you while your back is turned, goddess. And that's kind of true. You can't be everywhere, so you can't be everywhere. Do you? Are you one of the people? Are you of the mind that you think she does need to make decisions? She needs to be on either Krakoa or Raka. Um. Yes. Maybe. I don't know. I think I'm okay with either it going either way. I do like seeing the. I'd like to see, I guess, the pressure maybe a little bit longer before she ends up making a decision. Um, again. I've talked before about, like, my interest in Storm and, like, Storm being a leader and Storm being cool as hell. Um, But, like, Storm was stagnant for a while where she was just, like, there because no one would let anything happen to her. Or they put her in these leadership positions and then she'd get them and be like, no, I want to do that, and then leave. I'd rather see, like, why she wants to leave or, um, or how she is operating while she is in that leadership role. So at least now with this, like, we're seeing her have to decide how she wants to operate with the Iraqi because they're new people and they have their own culture. And, or we have to see if she has to, she's splitting her time. So girl, are you with Krakow or are you up there on Mars? Like, what are you doing? And I think that um, I'd like to, I guess, maybe see that a little bit more before she decides. And I'd like to see her make the decision. Not just, it, not it be made for her as in, you know, I like how to make that decision before they get rid of Morocco or before mm-hmm. before, before there's like some big battle on Krakoa where it's like, well, obviously, girl, she's going to go back to 
control. Oh, okay. I'd rather come be her own decision. Yeah, I understand. I get that. I agree with that. That's it. What do you? You don't. I know you don't read X Force. What are your thoughts on Colossus as a Russian spy? That seems a little problematic. Okay. <laughs> like. I just wanted to make sure. Like the Russian the spy. I don't know. I remember like I've been like hearing <laughs> about it. And I don't know, I haven't been keeping up with X-Force. I've been reading on Marvel Unlimited, so I'm a little bit behind on that one as well. But kind of just like seeing Colossus just sitting there and like knowing that this plot is simmering in the background. I was sitting there, I was like, he couldn't do anything else? Right. Colossus? Like, like I don't think that's just a little stereotypical to make the Russian. I don't know. <laughs> that... We'll see how that goes, though. But that, that, that storyline is always interesting to me. Yeah. And I feel like that plot point was brought up a really long time ago, as far as him and Mikhail, or Mikhail like. I think it's. On him, right? I think it's been like a very long going, ongoing story in X Force. That like one thing. I mean, per- Percy is writing a very long form story over there. It's still going, and it's still going strong. So shout out to him. I think it's something that's gonna have big effects. Maybe Fall of X is coming. That could have something to do with it too. Yeah, um, I will say the art in this issue was not too bad. Storm looked cool. Body down. Mm, yeah, it's pretty. What would you rate Overall, it? Overall, I would have given it, I'd give it a three out of five. <laughs> three point five. <laughs> with, the, with the strength of it all being Storm. Okay, okay. I'd give it like a 3.76. <laughs> okay. You know, I think there's some things that were like, again, I really do appreciate the pressure. I like the drama. I think some of the character voices, again, feel a little like wonky at times. I don't think the Mother Righteous stuff is like needed as much as it is we're currently getting in a lot of the books. She just doesn't resonate for me as a character. Honestly, it just feels like sinister stuff all over again. It, it is. She wants the exact same thing. He was trying to get Dominion. She's trying to get Dominion. You've just added this like weird MacGuffin aspect of magic and everyone thanking her and nobody questioning her when she comes into these rooms like this lady this red lady just appears this red lady with no shoes on is walking into the room just saying all this stuff and everybody's just like oh yeah okay who are you we got 50 telepaths here nobody's reading her mind y'all read everybody else's mind nobody's reading her nobody's questioning why can't we if we're not what telepaths are there? Everybody's gone. Xavier, Emma, even um, Emma. Like when you think about the stuff when they were going into the pit, she not saying nothing. That's true. Mobile mother, right? And then and, and everybody's just saying thank you. Y'all don't think that's weird? Maybe it's gonna blow back. I hope the card. I hope. I do hope the like four sinister thing doesn't. Like, I'm over for a really long time. <laughs> you know. Um, I like over. Sinister, especially as a villain, but like having four of him just seems redundant. redundant. But whatever. We'll see how that goes. Mother Righteous, she can go. But those are books of the I'm week. I'm not mad at them having a magic villain. That's not a bad idea. I, I, mean, but, bag is nice. I mean, but they've had magic villains before. I mean, even over in Legion of X, you got Margali um, doing stuff to Kurt, making the monsters and things like that. I don't necessarily... I'm not, again, I'm not opposed to the magic aspect and all that. It just genuinely feels like sinister just with magic coding. It doesn't feel yeah. fresh. It doesn't feel new. It's just like, okay, you're just giving me the same thing. You spit on my cupcake, but that's fine. <laughs> we'll take a break and then we'll come back. <laughs> Let's do it. I need to post some like body update pics. I've been in the gym. Working on your fitness? Working on my fitness a little bit, trying to get the boobs up. So it's been fun. Oh, that's right. It's summer <laughs> time. It's almost here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Welcome back to the watch section of the show. And this week we watched Guardians of the Galaxy 3. And it is written and directed by James Gunn. This is an MCU film. And uh, the third installment of, like, the Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy. And, um, yeah, it was 
a movie. <laughs> I um Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was just okay. My initial reaction right now, um, before we get into like the plot and and get into all the details of it was just I don't know, it was all right. Like I am not um super connected to the Guardians characters, so all of the emotional beats didn't really hit me that hard. And um I actually think Guardians 2 is the worst of the MCU. Um, one of the worst. Because that last Thor movie might be right sitting right next to it, too. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I thought it was okay. Um, my first, like, overall opinion is I honestly, I kind of liked it. I think oh. that I enjoyed the first Guardians movie a lot. I did not enjoy 2. And I think anything that I have seen of the Guardians movie since 2 has been bad. Um, and that's like, you know, their appearances in the Thor movies, the Avengers movies, the holiday specials. Like, I think all of that is bad. I think they've been very unlikable. I think Guardians Volume 3 is the first time since the first movie where I've actually enjoyed watching the Guardians. And I was like, oh yeah, I could probably see myself enjoying more of this team. I will say there are still some aspects that I don't like, especially what they do with the characters. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go in. Um, and just in terms of the adaptation of them and how they are in the movies versus the comics that I just don't jive with personally, but the movie itself overall, I thought it was fine. Yeah, I thought it was all right. Whatever. Um, all right, so getting into the plot of the movie, we find out that Rocket was basically um, taken from Earth as a kid, as a little baby raccoon by one of the high evolutionary and he was experimented on and became one of these like cyborgy anthropomorphic creature things as we know him to be now and then he ends up meeting lila and atifs and flora they would we know their names later but i'm just going to call them that um then they were these other like little creatures that were also in the movie at this point i felt like oh this is going to be like pulling at very low heartstrings <laughs> in my opinion like oh it's <laughs> oh because you don't care so i'll say i don't rocket's not my favorite character in the mcu but i did find the story very heartwarming and touching i think a lot of people can you know resonate to or empathize with just you know having the group of friends and wanting to do more like getting to know people and all of that good stuff i think even if you don't care about rocket i think the story was told very well right I just kind of know. I don't know. I felt like it was, oh, very easy to do, was what I'm trying to say. It's like, oh, well, if we want to tell this, like, story where we're going to go out on a sad note or we're going to kind of pull at people's heartstrings, let's do the the cute animal thing. I mean, what else does Rocket really have? I don't know. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but, but anyway, he ends up meeting, like, a walrus and a rabbit and an otter and i think they're they are kind of cute again they're just kind of you know playing up the, the cute the cute trope <laughs> um and uh by the as the movie goes on we see in the current state that like um star lord is a drunk and because he's still missing gomora and everybody wants to kind of move on from that except him Everyone, they're also like setting up shop. They have a, in the headquarters now in nowhere. That's like Guardians headquarters, which was ahead of a dead celestial. Um, I thought that was interesting, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's like, why does everything you say have a question mark at the end? Because <laughs> I'm confused <laughs> on why we decided to do a lot of these things, but whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> but all of a sudden, crashing through, here comes Adam Warlock. And um, he ends up coming after a rac uh, Rocket Raccoon. And um, I thought this was kind of cool, only because <laughs> all it did was make me think of Wonder Man and how I'm excited <laughs> to see him do all this stuff. Um, if anyone out there is able to clip his scenes and like change it to purple so I can get a little visual real quick of what that's going to give, that would be fantastic. Um, but he comes in, ends up beating up Nebula, which I understand sometimes when the characters who can like regenerate are always used to like get Show beat up. There is somebody is or like yeah beat up really excessively. Yeah, but like 
I knew that that was going to happen to her the moment in the intro anyway, when she got hit with the arrow straight in her chest. And it was like, okay, I see she's always going to give that. And pretty much any fight scene she was in, she would like basically be completely dismembered. Not yeah. dismembered, but like she was contorted. Hurt. It was, yeah. That I, man's like her thing. I don't know. I can't tell you too much about Nebula. though. So, but yeah, I agree that every time she was in a fight, <laughs> they would tear. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was like that, and it went not, and it was noticeable. It was like, oh, okay, yeah, like her neck just got snapped, or her arm just got broken, or all the stuff like that. It was, it looked like it hurt, but I guess it didn't. I'm sure, like people who like James Gunn, probably think this stuff looks cool. So, like, <laughs> that makes that makes sense. Um, but like, Rocket ends up getting hurt. And um, he's going into like this crazy cardiac arrest. They try to put a mad kid on him, but it like shocks him because they they find out there's this like bomb basically on his heart. And if he have, anyone tries to operate on him, he will uh, self destruct. So they do some diagnostics. Who I guess also like Nebula is kind of a MacGuffin <laughs> because all of a sudden like she works in everything. She's locked um, and she's reading the forensics files. She's got the heart <laughs> operation, like she knows it all. Which also, I thought that whole little bit about Rocket being um, operated on was interesting because I feel like he's been hurt before and like he might've done something on himself, but maybe I guess just like fully going into his chest is what operates the kill switch. Right, I think it's like more invasive surgeries or maybe, in, in, I don't know. Um, but that goes on. Um, they find out that like there's this Orgo Corp who is the one who was responsible for like this um uh, like the virus or whatever that is on his I don't want to call it a virus, but the the design or the the code that is written into his um like heart bomb is made by this Orgo Corp, which is the high evolutionaries company, which like I don't know, I thought that whole place was just weird. Like <laughs> when they get there. I, I liked like, it. I liked the way how it was, um, it was like flesh, and it looked weird. It looked different. It's something that I would expect to see in space. Like I don't want things to look normal. Yes, that much I, I completely understand. I did also like that the it was like organic, like tech stuff that they were using, which I thought was a different. <laughs> You know, but at the same time, I don't know. Sometimes something about it coming from James Gunn just makes me feel gross. <laughs> <laughs> I, will say that. I will also say this about the real. Uh, th- there was a part in this um, scene of the movie where they were like talking about the colors on the suits and like who was talking to who and things like that. This is one of the few times where I actually kind of laughed. And I will say that, I, again, of all the Guardians' appearances, I do not laugh. This movie, I actually laughed out loud like a few times. So shout out to them for that. I think the humor. This one did get a chuckle. It's been in the past. Yeah, this one got a couple of chuckles out of me too, like more than the other ones, especially the second. <laughs> but I did like a couple, a couple times. I did find myself laughing. So um, that was great. Although some of the clips I thought were they lasted a little too long. Um, it's just that they were like overdrawn, especially the whole like. Star Lord trying to like make Gamora remember they they want to be together. After a while, I was like, hang it up. <laughs> like, uh, we I hope we don't even have to keep coming back to this. And I will talk about Gamora a little bit later as well, I'm sure. But I will also give it to Zoe. This is probably my favorite showing of Gamora in the MCU since the first movie. <laughs> yes, I was actually going to say that that she is she was my favorite in the movie. I really yeah. liked I really liked Gamora a lot in this. Um, I thought Zoe did her thing, and I thought she was just really cool this this. felt like the most dangerous woman in the galaxy to me yes (laughs) yeah i was like oh okay yeah now i'm rocking with something i have not gotten that before even the wig looked better it did they gave it a part i was like oh this is nice they spent a little money on this (laughs) she's like she had a little length going on yes i said come on we see a green scalp yes all right we got something working here Mm -hmm. it was nice Uh, it changed with a little ombre in the back sometimes it was it was it was nice Mm-hmm. Um, but I felt like she was pretty cool. She ends up being like the informant that Nebula says, like, oh, I know someone that can get us into Orgo Corp. Um, we find out that it was Gamora. And um, 
they all try to like break in. Then we meet uh, what's that guy's name? Nathan Fillion. Which like this I do not Nathan Fillion. I'm sorry, I do not understand the appeal of him or like what gets everybody jumping when he's on screen. He is just another man. He just he just a tall white man. That's it. But thank, we dodged a bullet, y'all, because he was almost Wonder Man. <laughs> and I, rem- I remember when they were both that. Like, Ooh, and I was like, mm, mm-hmm. I guess. And, and he was, Wonder Man was almost going to appear in Guardians, I think, too. Um, so. It was like a poster of him or something, too, didn't they do? Yeah, they did, go, they did a bunch of mock up posters um, of Simon's movies. And they were going to have him, like, they were going to show, like, a theater of him putting on, a, like, a, a, a movie thing, a film festival. And... Oh, that would be cute. It would have been... Yes, not, on, not, not by that. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a good idea. No. Now, I prefer whatever they're going to be doing now, because I, allegedly they were filming down at the L.A. Comic Con, at the convention center. Mm-hmm. And I think that they probably have Wonder Man down there doing, like, Comic Con and appearances or something like that. I think that'd be cute. Um, that would. Anyway, we're not talking about Wonder Man. <laughs> this this movie. Um, so they all break in. We see Nathan Fillion. He's like a security guard. They're making these like jokes about having like a slow person on their team back back and forth to each other. Um, and uh, then they actually so, like actually flush their suits out into the into space they have no way to figure that out the team separates try to figure out how to like get their way out of this um they reach this perceptionist who like i couldn't tell if her if the lighting was changing or if her skin color was actually supposed to be changing every time she appeared because sometimes she was red and sometimes she was purple and then sometimes she was like like an orange tan color I don't even sometimes, think I'm, I think sometimes I thought, the makeup and go all the way down to her neck because you just no reckless care. I think that's just what I thought it was. I thought they was just like messing up the makeup. <laughs> <laughs> that like, seems oh. more MCU ish than like, oh, her skin is changing. <laughs> don't want to give them the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> um, but they end up like Nebula. I'm sorry, uh, Gamora ends up like being kind of cool. I thought at this point where she's like being a. Uh, Taking a hostage, taking everyone like a hostage, took that girl as a hostage. Um, she's like, you know, to I will say also, the also that scene of her like taking the girl as a hostage was really funny. Yes, <laughs> and, like, just shooting everybody, and they're like, This is the plan. <laughs> like, no, when she shot that girl in the leg, I was like, oh, Okay, yes, because <laughs> <laughs> she, yeah, she was like, No, I'm not trying to do this, and she's like, ah. <laughs> Yeah, Gamora was great in this movie. I did like her. This was Gamora. Um, Shout out to Zoe. She went out with the bang. Yeah. So they end up um, taking the the like file that was for Rocket that had all of his like information on it or whatever. They take it and go back to their ship. They open the file, find out that like it isn't any of the information that they needed. Like some guy had already taken it. Gamora ends up staying uh, back with Rocket. Um, while the other ones go and they try to figure out how to get, they find High Evolutionary's like uh, location, go straight to him. Now, as we get to the High Evolutionary on his planet, I don't know if this was intentional, but did you notice on his ship the Sinister Diamonds? Yes, I did see those. Uh, but so, was, was like, right, <laughs> right. I don't want to give them the benefit of the doubt because if in the in the comics. Um, the human evolutionary was, I'm sorry, the high evolutionary was actually influenced by Sinister. He got his start by working with Sinister and like reading a lot of his uh, stuff on genetics. So I thought that maybe this was like a little Easter egg there, but uh, that could be a little, that could be giving them too much. It could be. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I could see I it, know. but it could be. Yeah, I don't know. That could be giving it too much. Um, but they are all on Counter Earth. They're again being this like wacky, plucky team. Um, Adam Warlock shows up and uh, he's trying to, again, like fly through all this stuff and, and come and getting, uh, I think he was again going after Rocket. Back on the ship, um, everyone is trying to 
get to the high evolutionary to kind of stop him because I guess at this point like he is um I'm sorry they want to get to that guy I forget his name with the piece on his head they end up falling into him how did you like the powers that they were showing for high evolutionary in the comics he is telekinetic um and has some other like telepathic abilities too but did you like the way they kind of showed his powers in there? I think the I think he didn't he mention it was gravity in the movie. Was yeah, it? in the movie they said that he he worked on himself like he tested on himself and like reversed gravity so that on himself so that he could control it. I like it. I like gravity powers. I'm not gonna lie to you. I think they're interesting for some reason. Um, but I like the way they did it. He seemed very menacing. He was he. I, th- I mean, I thought the High Evolutionary was great though. I thought he yeah, I thought it was great. The actor was great. Felt like a villain. I think a lot of times the MCU tries to do the sympathetic villain route and kind of make you feel for the people, and it was just like, no, this was just a bad guy, and he was nasty mm-hmm. like for his downfall. So I thought that it was really good. Yeah, um, I will say that when we got to Counter Earth and we had everybody kind of separating, doing their own things there, trying to uh, stop the High Evolutionary. How are we going to have not only Counter Earth, but the High Evolutionary and not have a Bova appearance? Like, no Bova Easter egg, nothing? Maybe she can come back. I thought that I, I wasn't expecting her to be a character, but I did expect some kind of Easter egg of her somewhere. Because we had all these other kind of creatures. I Pretty figured nice. we would have. Cool. Um, I will say a lot of the stuff on Counter Earth is kind of where I did start to get a little irritated with the movie, mostly because this is where I was talking about those adaptations and how they've done certain characters, Drax, Mantis, and all the cosmic characters. Yeah, even Adam Warlock. And you know, I'm an Adam Warlock fan. I was not a fan of him. Honestly, he wasn't even really in the movie that much, to be perfectly honest. No, not really. Um, but I felt like there were a lot of opportunities where, not excuse me, opportunities, a lot of instances where it felt like he was just kind of forgotten. And then, oh, all of a sudden he's there again. And it was just mm-hmm. like, oh, this feels weird, feels awkward. I do not enjoy the way that Mantis is in this universe. I hate the whole kind of quote unquote lovable idiot thing she's got going on. Um, I do appreciate that they at least tried to add some more of her kung fu skills into this movie and like show they her. They um, But even the relationship that she has with Drax, I don't like Drax. I'm sorry, I just don't see it for that character at all. Nebula. I think this is probably the most I've ever actually noticed Nebula. I feel like she's been a part of the Guardians movies for a very long time now, but she still always kind of feels like an afterthought. I feel like this is the first time I was like, oh my gosh, like Nebula speaking, this is what she does in this group. Um, And that man with the guns. Mm -hmm. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) The, the, The damage that they've done to this this particular group, and not only just all the cosmic characters, but particularly the, the Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Wild. But this is, I think, what everyone is going to see as Star Lord. No, but I think that, <laughs> like, the Counter Earth really did just show me that I was like, oh, they have done in my opinion, a big disservice to a lot of these characters. Because I feel like that's where we started getting a lot of kind of like the character arcs forming or like taking shape and kind of coming to a head and everyone reacting to stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, this isn't working for me at all. But it's still the most enjoyable it's been. So what they do, at least I appreciate it. Like, okay, you're actually trying to like make them a little bit more serious and like bring it home and keep it a little bit more grounded as opposed to just being the laughing stocks the entire time. Mm-hmm. Yes, so they were uh, fighting High Evolutionary. They end up, um, I'm sorry, uh, Star-Lord jumps out of the window with uh, that guy and and then, like, Groot jumps after him and grows these, like, tree wings, which didn't really make a lot of sense to me, but whatever. (laughs) They were, like... All the tree, all the, like, Earth tree characters do it. Swamp Thing does it, too. You just got to give it to them. I don't know that was a thing for them, but okay. <laughs> I guess they have these tree wings, um, which like were branches that let them kind of glide down and uh, they end up like killing the guy, taking the piece off of his head. They go in. And that was cool that scene. I will give that to them. They did that. Yeah. Him just dying under there, with him, <laughs> bubbling up. Yeah. And drowning him. <laughs> dragging him on the ground after you like jump out and you're like dragging him across and then get to the river and you drown him and it's like you pop the thing out of his head. I don't know. It was hot. But a knife. It was something. 
<laughs> um, Rocket is having these like near death experiences. Well, I'm sorry, not near death. He's basically dying, <laughs> and he's in this like limbo area, which is sad that he would imagine it to still be the cages um, that he was in. Um, while Lila is speaking to him about like you know we are in the sky, uh, but you don't need to be here. Like you need to stay there. Um, and they end up fixing Rocket. Everybody ends up, you know, rallying together there. They're going to go stop the High Evolutionary because he has did a kill switch to completely destroy Counter-Earth. And while his, like, ship flies off, they end up on his ship. They end up, like, running into the bunch of kids when they break into it, um, who are also, I guess, these experiments who are going to be, like, the new colony for the high evolutionary that he was going to be creating um, because he felt like he needed to unlock the ability to think for and, and, and innovate that Rocket had because Rocket was able to think of a way to fix his uh, genetic experimentations that he's he, always creating. You know what I'm saying? He's always yes. again doing guys this, this, and that's like the high evolutionary stance. He's like, yeah, I can tell these people what to do, no problem. But if they can't also start to think for themselves, what does it make? What does the difference does it make? Yeah, which I thought was cool that that was like the plot for Rocket, since he is always tinkering and and basically being an engineer and coming up with something. Um, because the high evolutionary was a pretty good villain in this and was written fairly well. I like um, him. and I like the the guy's performance too. I thought he did like crazy maniac very well. Yeah. So then we see that the um there's a bunch of kids. They've also been experimented on. They've all got white hair, um, of all different races and, and backgrounds. And they were gonna be this next group of people who the high evolutionary was gonna use and after that if they're trying to like the uh, Gardens of the Galaxy are all trying to break in, stop the High Evolutionary. He is going to um, like launch everything and destruct every. I'm sorry, destroy parts of the building. But this like one ball head girl is like, no, don't do that. We want to take over. He says, y'all can like talk back to me and kills everybody. <laughs> ball head girl, because she was like, I'm done. She was like, <laughs> nah. she said she grabbed a little gun. She pulled up. She said, I'm taking command of this ship like and everybody was backing her up i said oh she's real it didn't matter though because and also you've been watching this guy be crazy with like all this tremendous power for like however long now y'all ain't have nothing planned no you thought you were just gonna whip out your gun and he was gonna come quietly <laughs> 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 like be serious yeah they weren't really thinking that one all <laughs> <laughs> at all <laughs> all that brain so, and nothing on the side turn it on maybe he took that idea out of their heads or <laughs> take that part out of their genetics but they um end up all dying because the high evolutionary like uses powers and kills everybody there uh the ship ends up being connected to the um big celestial headquarters because they're going to try to rescue and save everybody um they do and there was a moment where Star Lord tries to jump back, but then he doesn't make it, and his face like starts to freeze because he's entering space. And this is where I was like, I thought he was half celestial. What happened to that? Did we just like drop that? Or was that ever I mean, explained? I'm not. I'm really cool with anything about MCU Star Lord kind of beyond. It was fake. Because <laughs> 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 it doesn't make any sense. I thought he was half. Either. And like Alexio. my thing, and here's my thing when it comes to Chris Pratt as Star Lord, I know that there'd be a lot of controversy about him and like discourse in the streets about his what he does and who he. Is. I don't care about none of that. To be perfectly honest with you, my thing about Chris Pratt as Star Lord, it comes down to simply his levels of charisma and skill, and I find those very low. Yes, and. and when you think of Star-Lord in the comics, like, you know, I've, I've read him, I like him, I get into him a lot. There is, like, just kind of an edge. And just, Chris Pratt is just not a star. He's just not an action star. I'm sorry, you're not excited to see him. 
do these things and it just never really sells for me and i also hate the way that they have really like kind of dumbed down a lot of what the element gun should do and like the abilities it has um but i, I forgot it was an element gun but that's, i thought it was just a regular blaster i forgot it was an element gun. <laughs> <laughs> well i there's something that we'll talk about a little bit for that in terms of that when we get later on. So go ahead, continue with this movie. But that's, and then again, this scene also was a big part of what I was saying about Adam, where it felt like he was forgotten until just a moment where he was needed all of a sudden, because you got Peter out here in space, all of a sudden he's freezing him, he's uh, dying and no one can save him. And then Adam just pops back up and like pushes him back to the side. But where were you at when we were just fighting the high evolutionary? Where yes. were you at when we were trying to save all these kids? What were you doing? Yeah, I don't know. He was just sitting there watching, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I, I guess I got the point of them kind of recreating the image of the creation of Adam, you know, when he came here and touched his finger. Okay. I got the imagery, but <laughs> again, but okay. Um, they end up saving Star-Lord, uh, but then the group all ends up as like, oh, by the way, they already had killed High Evolutionary. We didn't kill the High Evolutionary. They like had this really cool fight scene that I will admit was cool. Their hallway fight was probably the best one in the movie. Um, I thought everybody looked really cool, except Nebula. Like, <laughs> I just don't think you see it for Nebula. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't see it for like people who need to get beat up like that oh. every time, and like that's yeah. their thing. I can like that. It gets a little bit tiresome, and it can feel a little bit um like that cheerleader from the torture heroes. a little bit sometimes. It's like, oh yeah, of course we're gonna like do every horrible thing to you because you're never gonna come back. Wolverine falls into that issue sometimes. Yes, he but, he used to a lot. But I do agree that that hallway scene was really good, and again, this is a really great showing for Gamora. It felt like the deadliest woman in the galaxy. She was, she was yes. doing the thing with her sword. Her hair was like maybe it was just the yeah. hair. Maybe that's all she needed. Got a better wig. <laughs> <laughs> Is her final pose when she stood her up? Pose, yes. She was doing really good. I also loved a lot of the humor bits with her and Groot. And like whenever he was talking, she was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> when she said, y'all just make up what he said, don't you? <laughs> like, I, I thought that was cute. So they're good for them. Like, great scene that way. It was a good fight. Yeah. yeah. The Gamora was fine in that part. I, really, I do like her a lot in this movie. Um, but they had the hallway scene. They peeled off a uh, high evolutionary space. We see them talking with nothing. Um, and instead of killing them, Rocket says, I'm not going to kill them. I'm a guardian of the galaxy. And that's when the explosion happens. They save everyone, save the animals, then save the the, keep the kids. Um, I'm sorry, they save the animals first. <laughs> um, no, I'm sorry, they save the kids they, first. They save the kids first, and then they went back. They were going to save the animals. <laughs> <laughs> but Rocket was like, no, actually, you got to save them too. Yes, and I remember one guy saying, like, oh, I thought we were only going to save higher life forms, but they brought the animals up over there, too. And then then the group has a little team meeting because Star-Lord is like, hey, y'all, we need to meet up. I got something I need to say to the group. And he said, all right, I'm going to go solo. <laughs> <laughs> he said he's going back home for a little bit. <laughs> vacation. <laughs> He said, I'll take care of my PTO, and I'm not going to be here for a little bit. Um, and Mantis said she's there. going solo. Now, yes, now Mantis said I'm leaving. Um, <laughs> it was funny that, like, after star was like, oh, you know, I'm going to go back to Earth. My granddad lives there. I'm going to go, you know, learn how to swim instead of jumping from pond, lily pad to lily pad. And he was done doing his sappy moment, and Mantis was like, well, <laughs> while we're here, I'm leaving, too. <laughs> I'm going to bounce. So I thought that was funny. Then it seemed like the team was pretty much broken up. Nebula says that she's going to stay uh, and make this like a city and run it like there's like their little governor or something there. Um, Drax and because he's good with yes. kids. Apparently that's his whole thing. He wanted. To, he, they said that they realized he needs to be a dad because that's where he fits great. Which is interesting because his daughter is Moon Dragon. So. I always thought that at one point they would reveal that because he always talked about how he was trying to get like vengeance on mm -hmm. the death of his daughters. And I thought one day he'd realize, oh, my daughter's still alive. It's Moon Dragon. Mm -hmm. That is, we never got there. Maybe. Or maybe, I don't know. We'll see. I don't know if I want Moon Dragon to show up in any of these. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I'm okay. It's 
you're such a gamble having your fave show up in these <laughs> in these things because who knows which way they can go. Um, but then the team ends up breaking up. Uh, they have one last little hurrah. They dance a little bit together to. Um, I can forget the name of the song. This is ain't your brother. The dog days are over. <laughs> right? <laughs> I like Florence in the Machine. I just couldn't think of the name of that song. <laughs> Um, but yes, then we see a mid credit scene of the new Guardians that is um, a fully grown up Groot, Cosmo the dog, Craglin, Adam, Phila, Bell, and that little thing, Blurp. And they're on um, a, like a new mission and stuff, but we see like a whole new team. Phila has the powers. So. I did not like the Phila re- reveal. Um, I feel like I only knew it was Phila everybody because LZ had told me like last week that the girl was going to be in the movie and the girl had like <laughs> playing Phila. If I didn't know that ahead of time, I would not have known who that little girl was. Would she just have been some random girl who had powers at the end? I, I just would assume she was one of the little girls that they rescued. And I would have like, and I would be like, why they let this little girl on the team? <laughs> yeah. They probably could have said her name or something at some point or given some better inclination that she was. I didn't like that. It was real. I also, um, what was the other dude who took Yondu's arrow? I can never remember his name. Craglin. Craglin. I don't think I like Craglin. And my thing with Craglin is I felt like a lot of his scenes lingered for too long. There were a lot of like slow mos and stuff throughout this movie, I will also say. And I felt like there were a lot of scenes where it kind of just like focused on the character. Like it was like we just had a good five to ten, five to ten seconds of too much camera time, and I felt like all of that was going to crack, man. Every time he was on screen, I was like, I need him to go. And we were just mm-hmm. focused on him for so long. So I'm not really super excited to see him again. The Phil of Ravel, eh. But Adam's on the team. We'll see if he can be redeemed. And I did like him. Yes. Um, I do like Adam. Um, but then after uh, the post credit scene was uh, Peter Quill reconnecting with his grandfather, and it says Star Lord will return. So so now this is what I was talking about earlier when I was talking about the element guns. I assume that, you know, we got the news that the legendary Star Lord will, will return. So I assume they're going to kind of fall back onto the grounded arc he did where he was on Earth and Abigail Brand was like watching him because he was technically like an interplanetary fugitive. So she was like, you got to stay here. You're on probation. And that's when Chris Anker was drawing him. And he always looked really good with his abs out and stuff like that. So I, oh, yes, yes. if they're going to pull for that, and then also bring in some more aspects of like the Master of the Sun storyline and get more to that and actually make the blasters more into the element gun to get a little bit more comic accurate. But again, also, I feel like Chris Pratt is coming to the end of his contract. Yeah, he's or, in it for he's not, 10 years. Yeah, it was just his time with the MCU in general. So it's like maybe he'll get like one more thing to kind of do that and finish it off. But I don't know. I'm expecting okay. maybe another appearance in one other thing and then a secret of a secret wars and then that's it. Maybe. But again, like Chris Pratt as Star Lord has never really like moved me as much. I just don't think Chris Pratt is like a star. I'm sorry. So but I do like Star Lord and I would like to see a little bit more of a comic accurate Star Lord appear. So if they can kind of finish off with all of that, I'll be into it. Yeah. Uh I don't know. The Guardians. <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> all in all, I do think this whole brand for me. I, I do think the Rocket bits were very emotional. I think this has been, again, the best showing of the Guardians in a very, very long time. I think that if this is how you were going to kind of end off the story for a lot of these characters, they did a good job in doing that. And it sets up the next version if they're going to continue on. Um, I do have issues with just a lot of the adaptations and how the characters have been written in this group but that's just been something from the very beginning not necessarily anything to do with this movie yeah what would you rate this movie out of five i would give it like a solid like three point like eight okay I think it was good. I think there was some like James Gunn humor moments that didn't really sit with me. Like there was a scene I remember when we got into the ship and like Gamora was sitting on the toilet 
Yeah. Humor. So I, I was like, that was weird. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of toilet humor. So I was like, okay, this is kind of weird. Again, I thought there were a lot of slow mo scenes and some of the things long, lingered too long. The movie did feel long to me. Um, one of the people I was with in the theater kept asking me, he was like, what time is it? <laughs> 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 and then there was actually another guy in my row who fell asleep and he was snoring very loudly. So I think the movie did feel very long in that regard. But I was in, I, outside of those moments where I was like, damn, this feels long. I was engaged in it. Yeah, okay. I would end up giving this movie um, like a 2.75. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's not terrible. <laughs> it's not something I'd watch again. I was about to say, do you think you'd watch it again? No. For me, whenever I'm looking at a lot of superhero movies, I grade them, quote unquote, on a how comic accurate it is, Mm -hmm. how entertaining it is, and if it's just a good movie overall. So, like, for me, this is not very comic book (laughs) accurate at all. A lot of these characters are not that. Um, I wasn't that entertained overall. Mm -hmm. Like, I I found myself being kind of bored at moments. Um, But it's not a bad movie. Like, Mm -hmm. it's not a a bad movie, so I'm gonna give it like a 2.75. And again, and even though some of those James Gunn humor moments didn't work for me, when they did work, I did find them funny. So it's like I can't give it credit for that. I find myself laughing like a few times. Yeah, got some chuckles out of me. I'll give them that. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Please make sure you guys rate and subscribe us wherever you get your podcast. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Another Relaunch. You can watch us on YouTube at Another Relaunch TV. You can find me on most social media platforms at UncannyLZ. Keenan, where can they find you? You guys know you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Keenan Lance. As always, there's an underscore at there. Boom, boom, boom. All right, y'all, let's get up out of here. We'll catch you next week. Peace.